Hi there, and welcome to today's webcast, Five Network Defense Lessons from the SolarWinds Hack, presented by Corelight. My name is John Gamble. I'm Director of Product Marketing here at Corelight, and I'm excited to uh, share some insights today uh, you know, from myself, but also from my esteemed colleague, Greg Bell, who is our Chief uh, Strategy Officer here at Corelight and has a background in uh, network management and defense. Um, and so I'm hoping he'll mention a little bit about some of the work he's done prior to Corelight, uh, which informs our perspectives here. But uh, really quick, just some housekeeping. Uh, today's webcast will be recorded, uh, so you can share it with colleagues who weren't able to attend or rewatch it yourself if you're not able to attend for the full length. We're going to try to keep it short and sweet. Uh, everybody is working from home these days and on Zoom, and, and we recognize Zoom fatigue. So we're going to try to keep this to 30 minutes uh, and, and save a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. You can just type them into the questions uh, tab of the GoToWebinar uh, control interface. We'll see them. We're going to hold questions until the end. And if we don't have time to get to your question, uh, we can follow up with you afterwards because we have your email address. Lastly, uh, a copy of today's presentation has been uploaded uh, onto the control uh, interface for GoToWebinar. So if you uh, check the handouts tab, uh, you should see a PDF uh, of this presentation. So you can actually download that PDF, uh, share it with colleagues if you want. And there's also some hyperlinks for some resources, which we'll talk about later on. So with that, let's get started. Greg, uh, I, I gave a hint at your background and kind of your experience in this respect, but maybe you could tell the audience a little bit more about yourself. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, John. And thank you to everyone who has tuned in. Uh, as John said, I'm one of the co-founders at Corelight, but before that, I spent most of my career as an operator working for the U.S. Department of Energy, so um, advancing missions of scientific discovery, but also nuclear stewardship. So it was a very um, interesting environment, a very sensitive one, and I thought a lot about defending networks and using data to do that. And in the roles that I had there, the tools that we're commercializing here at Corelight, including Zeek, formerly called Bro, now called Zeek, were really foundational to the um, tool stack that we deployed and very important in our ability to defend critical networks. So I'm happy to talk a little bit more about their application potentially in your networks. Great, thanks Greg. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm Director of Product Marketing here at Corelight. Uh, I've spent my career representing uh, cybersecurity products uh, across the data protection spectrum from identity verification to endpoint protection uh, to, to um, you know, privacy technologies. And uh, here at Corelight, I've been here almost three and a half years representing, of course, uh, network security technologies that Corelight offers. So with that, let's get to the first lesson here. Oh, actually, let's let's just back up for a quick second and just kind of level set on the solar winds attack, right? I think most people attending today or watching this webcast uh, are aware of the solar winds attack, uh, potentially intimately aware, uh, unfortunately, because of, uh, you know, their own research they've done in-house. But just really quickly here, I think, you know, what is one of the lessons uh, from this hack? It's not that supply chain uh, attacks, uh, whether those are adjacent or directly on the supply chain themselves are new, right? We've been dealing with this problem for uh, you know a decade plus now. We've got Stuxnet, right? Uh, where exploits in the Microsoft and uh, Siemens PLC uh, environments were exploited uh, to, to, to cause dramatic kind of real world effect. Uh, Target, of course, uh, that hack uh, came in uh, in part through their HVAC contractor and SolarWinds, right? And a really important piece of IT technology uh, for, for, for network management and environment management that was widely used by really large organizations and governments globally. I mean, thousands and thousands of customers rely on the, on the SolarWinds technology. And their Orion platform was, of course, the, the target of this attack. And uh, notably, right, uh, the, the adversaries here were actually able to directly compromise the supply chain, um, you know, compromise the, the certs used to sign that piece of software and, and really embed uh, themselves inside of the, the tool itself, uh, which then got distributed out to, you know, to, to, to many organizations that were using that tool and getting those software updates. And so it, it you know, it's another example of a, of a sophisticated supply chain attack. Uh, but at the same time, it, it's quite different uh, than the two examples we show here, because it really had a, a kind of broad potential impact given the number of customers that were using that compromised piece of technology. Um, Greg, anything to add there before we, we start diving into these lessons? No, I think that's great. Let's dive in. Let's do it. So the first, uh, the first lesson here, right? I think one of the lessons from the solar winds attack that we observed in talking to customers and organizations uh, that aren't our customers um, is just that kind of the traditional model of network defense. Uh, those techniques have left many organizations exposed, uh, and and this particular hack uh, demonstrates that exposure risk. So. So let me frame kind of kind of how we see the exposure risk, right, uh, before diving into the specifics of where those traditional or, or what you might call legacy uh, techniques uh, were leaving gaps in your stack. 
So this two by two matrix that you see here is kind of how we at Corelight think about um, the, your, your, your defense kind of strategy, right? You've got the X axis, which above that is things that are unknown or zero days, right? And below that axis is the things that we know about, the, the, the commodity, the, the criminal, the known um, kind of out there IOCs, threats that are recognized, actors that are recognized, for which there are uh, you know, known um, indicators or known behaviors that you can track. And the y-axis, right, that, that kind of middle line there is, is time, right? This is chronology. And so to the left, right, is everything that's happened in the past. And everything to the right is something that's happening right now or could happen in the future to you. And notably, that little red bar you see there between two zero, uh, T0 and TD in the top right quadrant, um, that's a very interesting and, and problematic kind of period of time, right? It's the time between the announcement of something that was unknown and the time between detection being engineered. Right, and that gap between T0 and TD can be hours, uh, can be days, can even be a week plus in some cases, depending on, on, on the nature of the attack and the response from the industry. And we saw this play out right in the, in the, in the solar winds attack because FireEye published their blog post on a Sunday night. Uh, I think it was around 5, 6 p.m. Pacific, somewhere around there. And the whole industry uh, and, and organizations that were potentially affected sprang into action, right? And there was a kind of scramble across the industry to respond in various you know, rule sets were written, IOCs were published, queries were, were formulated and shared, uh, detection engineering occurred, actual threat detections were instrumented in platforms. All of that took hours, days, even a week plus in some cases. And that's a really critical window to think about because um, it's, it's, it's what everyone's asking, right? When these things go down as a security person, it's your job to answer those pressing questions that in many cases are coming from the board. Were we affected and how do we respond, right? Those two fundamental questions. And so, if we think about kind of the threat landscape in this in this framework here, and we think about solar winds, right, and we think about the traditional techniques that that organizations are using to defend their networks, um, we see some we see some white space here. We see some gaps. Um, packet capture, right? Uh, many organizations spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in in, in in large organizations on full packet capture solutions, which are a phenomenal source of truth uh, about your network if you know exactly where to look and that thing happened to occur in the last few days or maybe a few weeks if you have the budget to store PCAP for that long. Um, but what it doesn't cover is the thing that happened three months ago or the thing that happened six months ago. And in the solar winds attack, right, um, those things were occurring many, many months ago. Um, they, they believe kind of the first major intrusion started happening back in March of 2020, reconnaissance happened before then. Um, so you're as a security person sitting there in your sock saying, I need to go back in time on my network to March to understand potentially if there was any sort of network um, event that I could go look at to see if we were potentially hit by this thing. You don't have that in packet capture. Um, on the IDS, IPS side, right, really great technology at, at flagging uh, known, the known, the below the X axis threats um, for everything coming at you, both now and in the future. Um, phenomenal at that, but of course, not going to help you in the case of an attack like solar winds because this is a fundamentally unknown attack. Nobody was out there looking for um, you know, specific, um, you know, domains, right, associated with this attack, because nobody knew about it until FireEye disclosed and published this, this attack. And then lastly, the, the, the last piece of kind of traditional uh, technique I would, I would point out here is you see NetFlow, that little gray banded spotted line uh, spreading across um, um, the entirety of the, of the X axis there. And it's not just NetFlow. Um, and if you're not familiar, NetFlow is kind of a, a, a often sampled uh, logging format that, that logs uh, network communications. Um, you can get it off your routers in many cases. Um, it's, it's sampled, so you're not necessarily getting a full, complete 100% picture because uh, it's sampled. And the information depth is, is pretty light. Um, if you're not familiar, you can kind of think about it like a phone call record you might get from your, from your wireless provider, who called who for how long, and maybe a few other details, but you're not actually getting much detail about the, the content of that conversation. Um, and there's many other types of, of these records, right? DNS you know, server records, SMTP records, your servers themselves generate these logs, uh, but they're but they're kind of very point and they don't provide a lot of information uh, because generally speaking, they were they were intended for IT use cases such as network performance monitoring or troubleshooting on these actual physical pieces of infrastructure. So how do we prepare right for the next sunburst? Uh, because we've got this problem if you're if you're reliant wholly on these traditional techniques, you've got these gaps, right? You're not going to be able to to figure out these fundamental questions here in red. Were we ever attacked, right? You need to answer that question for March of 2020 as an organization, because that's when we believe uh, the intrusion started to occur related to this. Um, you're going to have great difficulty answering that critical question uh, when everyone's losing sleep. No one's, you know, everyone's on all hands on deck that, that, that Monday when that thing, you know, suddenly hit the industry. Are we being attacked right now? Do we have an active problem in our environment? 
um, critical question to answer. Very, very difficult um, with, with those particular solutions and, uh, and techniques that I mentioned prior. And, and then of course, you know, can we find that next unknown attack, right? Um, do, we, do we have a shot at finding that next known attack? Um, again, that's you're, you're, if you're just relying on, on these technologies, um, you're, you're going to leave some significant gaps. So how can we fill those gaps, right? Second lesson, I think, from this attack is, uh, again, and we observed this by talking to customers and organizations that were actually doing this, right? They had a fundamentally different experience uh, when it, in terms of responding to this attack than organizations that didn't have this in place, which is a holistic approach to defending the network, a network detection uh, and response capability um, that was looking across ports and protocols, looking across time, kind of holistically analyzing, capturing uh, records of what was happening both today, but also six months ago in March, they were able to respond quite differently to this attack, right? These questions, those customers, those organizations that had a network detection and response solution in place, they had a much easier time getting to the bottom of these fundamental questions. And I'll just point out some examples here, right? If you look here on the top left quadrant, you see the installation and the command and control icons there, right? If you think about it, right, um, if 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 a malicious DLL file from from uh, the SolarWinds attack was was created and distributed your environment back in March 2020, and suddenly they started uh, connecting to C2s a few weeks later, right? Maybe call it the summer. Um, those are records that you only have one shot at catching on the network, just one time. It happens and it's gone. And with something um, you know, holistic, like a network detection and response platform, uh, you can actually capture uh, evidence of those activities occurring, keep them, and forensically, when it comes to that T0 moment, when that blog post gets published, uh, you can go back into your SIM and type in some queries once those IOCs are known and say, hey, did we ever see this domain in our environment at any point in the last 12 months? And you can answer that question in 10 seconds, right, in some cases. It's it's just a quick SIM query, and it's a it's a it's a fundamentally different kind of uh, response model because there's so much unknown if you don't have something comprehensively covering your platform. Now, you might be thinking, well, you know, we've got other security investments, other priorities this 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 year. You know, we're really looking at investing in EDR, for example. Um, you know, and are focused on our EDR rollout this year. That's great. Uh, you definitely need an EDR solution, but uh, we kind of refer to this model here that the analyst community, uh, in particular Gartner. Um, is fond of, right? The sock triad, the three-legged stool of how to tackle problems like these, right? You've got two fundamental sources of, of telemetry coming from your, your attack surface, right? Your network uh, surface, and then your endpoint surface, your servers, your, your computers, your mobile devices, uh, you know, in your environment or outside of your, your core corporate network. And then you have a central kind of source of analysis uh, and, and storage uh, for those you know, two fundamental sources of telemetry, which is your SIM or a data lake technology uh, that allows you to store and analyze that telemetry at scale. And that's, you know, what our customers uh, had uh, in place when this thing hit. And they were able in their in their SIM of choice to both use the, the network visibility that was provided by a solution like CoreLight in the NDR category and endpoint telemetry coming from solutions like Microsoft, for example, um, who published a lot of great research around this attack and very quickly and precisely answer um, questions uh, related to this attack, you know, where we attacked, when, where, how, um, you know, and, and how do we respond? It's it's just it's 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 a lot more efficient than sitting in a in a proprietary pane of glass from a vendor solution uh, that's a threat detection oriented solution, and it doesn't have the endpoint data integrated because it's not endpoint focused, and it doesn't have all of this rich data about your environment going back six months because it's detection focused. Um, those are two very different. Uh, defense models and those organizations had two very different experiences responding to this attack. With the solar winds attack, right? There were IOCs on both sides of the house. Um, there were hundreds of IOCs um, that that these organizations who had the SOC triad in place uh, when the when the breach was discovered and announced, and they could again quickly query in a central source of truth their SIM um, these questions and both hunt for active attack, uh, but also look for evidence of the past you know intrusion in their network if there wasn't currently a compromise in their environment. Um, you know, so again, um, we believe that the NDR can kind of plug a fundamental network hole that a lot of organizations have right now, given kind of reliance, over-reliance, I would say, on traditional techniques. And lastly, I'll just close with a quote here uh, before turning it over to Greg to walk you through the next three kind of major lessons is, um, you know, yes, we're core light. Yes, we're biased. We think the network is a great source of, of, of kind of truth. Um, but don't take our word for it, right? There are many organizations out there that, that recognize that, you know, the network is an excellent source uh, for breadth, 
of investigation, right? It's a great place to start an investigation, uh, whether that's a response, incident response investigation or a threat hunting exercise. Um, endpoints are great for depth. Uh, you can get a lot of telemetry, you know, down to the kernel la layer of the device from a, from an EDR solution. Um, we also recognize though that, that the network is a is a more fundamental and um, you know, immutable uh, record of truth uh, than, than, than endpoints in many cases. Because if you can compromise an endpoint, uh, again, at that kernel level, you can actually compromise the telemetry coming out of that uh, particular endpoint and the EDR solution agent on top of it, and it becomes a fundamentally unreliable narrator. Networks are very different. Um, many, many devious things one can do to, to, to evade network defenses, but at the end of the day, the bad guys have to push packets. And if you're there to capture, parse, uh, store and analyze those 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 communications at scale, you're going to have a tremendous advantage. And this is a great quote from uh, Rob Joyce. At the time, uh, he led the tailored access operations group at the NSA. That's the um, cyber intelligence kind of arm uh, of the NSA. So their job is to go out and collect, you know, uh, intelligence globally. Um, so they are sort of the red team, if you will, uh, of, of American cybersecurity defense. And, um, you know, Rob had this quote when he was the head of, of TAO at the time. He said, you know, one of their worst nightmares in terms of their adversaries discovering their their actions, their intelligence gathering exercises, was if was if their target was actually comprehensively monitoring the network, right? That was if if that's what's keeping the NSA up at night, uh, you better believe that it should keep up the the adversaries, the APTs, the organizations, the attacks you're trying to keep out of your organization. Um, if it if it keeps them up at night and, and they're worried about being discovered, um, it means it's an extremely powerful tool, and. Actually, Rob just got a, a new job, actually. I think Biden just appointed him uh, to, to lead the cybersecurity kind of arm of the NSA. So I think uh, he will be, you will see more from him in the, in the government soon. Uh, but again, just a quote from someone else, you don't have to take our word for it. Greg, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, John. Uh, we're gonna continue this rapid fire pace. Um, and this is sort of a lightning round of five uh, lessons learned from our perspective at Corelight. John just explained, the, I would say sort of the why of NDR technology. Why do you need NDR? Well, it fills critical gaps and it helps create an evidence library that is invaluable in um, when you're um, when you're in the midst of resolving an incident as um, fearsome really as the sunburst incident. And I wanna talk a little bit about flavors of NDR, sort of the options you have um, when you move into the NDR space, you have various choices. I would say several offerings in the market are closed solutions, and um, they're traditional in that sense. They're, they're sort of walled gardens of technology based on proprietary um, packet parsing, maybe detection technology. They might have points of integration with Intel sources, but they're not fundamentally designed to kind of play well in an ecosystem. And at, at Corelight, we're doing something different. Um, we think we have the right idea for NDR, the NDR of the future, which we're describing as open NDR. And we're really, we really deeply believe in the idea, we're championing it. And by open, I mean, um, we believe in open standards, open data formats, um, open platforms and community leverage as well, open community leverage. We think NDR just really wants to be open. Um, and it, this isn't just about idealism. Uh, openness gives you, as an operator, and remember I was a former operator <laughs> buying things from companies most of my career. Openness gives you more speed, more agility, um, extensibility, and a lot of choice as a security operator. So it's really um, comprehensively uh, beneficial. Um, thanks for advancing the slide, John. We, the, the three maybe key benefits of open NDR that we see here, first of all, is just open source. Um, that helps prevent vendor lock-in. It keeps everyone honest. It keeps the vendors honest. Uh, and if you get tired of Corelight, for instance, you can certainly make use of the open source technologies that we integrate together. We sustain the Zeek project. We have hired every committer to the project. We pour a lot of energy into sustaining and energizing that community. That's part of who we are, part of our business model. Um, and it gives you some comfort that um, the story isn't all about Corelight, it's about a large global community. Um, open data is, I think, equally interesting, a little bit more subtle of an advantage, but our data can be customized. It can be extended. You can integrate it into your workflows, and if you don't like exactly the data that Corelight produces by default, you can change the nature of it. You can add more fields, you can reduce it, and that turns out to be um, really interesting and powerful. And then the third, the third major benefit, I think, is just the architectural benefit of um, gaining access to community contributions, to Zeek, Suricata, to the population of IOCs, actually, that are circulated. Um, you can 
uh, in the Zeek universe, you can create behavioral detections for yourself. You can share them. You can use detections from other community members, or you can use detections from Corelight. Um, so that open architecture really multiplies the benefit uh, of NDR, um, and we think it's the right idea. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, John alluded to this, but I'll just say one of the best pieces of, of clear evidence for the benefits of open NDR really did unfold during SolarWinds when FireEye did such a nice job of, of describing in great detail the mechanisms of the compromise, lateral movement, and exploits, um, and, and piecing together that mechanism through data of all kinds, including Zeek data for sure, um, and then releasing onto GitHub hundreds of IOCs in different open formats, including Yara, Snort, and others. Uh, and then what happened immediately was that many, many companies who were equally committed to open ecosystems in the security space were able to take those IOCs, transform them, maybe um, uh, improve on them a little bit, merge them, and deliver them to their own customers. We did that at Corelight. Our partner, Sock Prime, did it. Proofpoint did it. Many, many other companies were able to do that. And just perfectly exemplifying the benefits of open NDR as an idea, we go from discovery to the implementation of remediation and detection very, very quickly because more than one company is involved, more than one community is involved. A, a global community of defenders is working together um, to up our collective game. And that's that's really um, what we're about in this company. So um, that's a bit on open NDR. Let's go to the next lesson, um, which is a little bit different. Um, thank you. Lesson number four from SolarWinds is that you need a strategy for encrypted traffic. Now, I think that's probably obvious. Um, sometimes it is possible to break and inspect traffic. And in some cases and in some um, enterprises, there's no expectation of privacy, and that's possible and feasible. But in many cases, it's not feasible, it's not lawful, um, it's not possible. And so you need a solution capable of making sophisticated inferences about encrypted traffic, um, even when you can't break and inspect. Let's go to the next slide. Um, Corelight has a lot of content online about techniques we use for this, and we often use this nice metaphor, I think John came up with it, um, that when you can't decrypt, what you need to do is similar to what you're doing as a kid, and you're trying to figure out what gift you've been given. It's a wrapped gift. What do you do? Well, you think about the size of it. Maybe you shake it and see if it rattles or if it seems to be soft. You judge its weight. And in the same way, our research team, Corelight Labs, is doing a lot of work to try to make clever inferences about the nature of encrypted flows, even when they can't be decrypted. We have um, a set of product capabilities focused on that, and there'll be more in the future, but it's actually quite surprising what you can learn um, from encrypted traffic streams. For one, they create artifacts. Encryption isn't just like a curtain that falls in front of the stage, but the process of encryption um, betrays op um, OPSEC uh, techniques and habits, sometimes laziness. You learn about um, certificates, you learn about a, a lot of methods. You can gather those, you can make inferences from them, and that's what we do at Corelight. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this blog post from Ben, ben Reardon on our team um, is actually one of several that we published on Sunburst, and it tells, um, it goes to more technical detail of the kind that I was just describing. Um, but it makes uh, the, uh, the obvious observation that adversaries use encryption too. They don't always use encryption. Surprisingly, you'll find some C2 communication that's unencrypted, but very often it's encrypted. And so you have to think a little harder and work a little harder to get to the truth of what's happening. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, I won't, it's not really a technical webinar and I, want, I don't want to dive too deeply into this, but I just want to give you a sense of how this works. Um, organizations during Sunburst that had access to high quality network data from Corelight and also from other sources could do this shaking of the box. They could stitch together, for instance, the initial plain text part of a malicious connection before encryption began using one of our logs, the HTTP log. They could pivot using a great feature of all of our logs, the UID, into another log, the SSL log, and really make a correlation, a meaningful correlation between an encrypted and an unencrypted stream. And together that correlation produced a kind of smoking gun. And sometimes that's called log craft, but it's the sort of work that um, skilled analysts do um, to really um, piece together the story of a compromise when, when the underlying traffic is largely encrypted. Let's move to lesson number five, again, moving rapidly. I think the final lesson for this webinar is that security teams really do need to start threat hunting today. And let's move to the next slide too. If you're putting all of your reliance on a 
on say on a vendor that's making somewhat exaggerated claims about the power of their AI uh, threat detection, you're going to be disappointed. And I'm not saying that there is no role for ML and AI in detection. There certainly is, and and we do that as well at Corelight. But remember that adversaries are also thinking along the same lines. They have read vendor literature as well. Um, th they will find the weak link. That's their job. Uh, and if you read the FireEye disclosure, what actually won the day, um, as far as I can tell, was a team that knew their network, uh, that had very high fidelity historical data to work with, and was simply curious about little signs of unusual activity. And, and I think your best shot uh, at catching the next SolarWinds attack is to know your environment better than your adversary, collect fantastic um, real-time data, keep it, and proactively look for and investigate anomalous activity. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, that is sometimes called threat hunting, uh, and it doesn't need to be expensive and it doesn't need to be intimidating. Really all it takes to get started on this journey is a curious person or two, a sim, and the right data. And in fact, um, this just getting started on that journey, I think, can help inspire talent and retain talent in your security team. It doesn't need to be a full-time job either. It can be a part-time job, a baton that's passed, and in some ways it's better to democratize threat hunting, in my view, uh, demystify it a little bit. And I think that makes um, the SOC more satisfied, happier, and also more effective if we can do that. Let's go to the next slide. Um, at Corelight, we really, really want to support threat hunters and incident responders. And we've created a lot of resources to help teams make progress on that journey. I would just call your attention to the webinar uh, on the upper left, which is a joint effort with SANS and Optiv called Demystifying the Hunt. And that's a really good place to start. And, and another place I would call your attention to is, is the um, document in the middle, the threat hunting guide that we've published, recently upgraded and greatly expanded. And it's, it's meant to live in the SOC. It's put together by defenders, defenders who happen to work at Corelight, but they have broad operational experience and it's really designed for defenders. It's full of well-organized, full of practical things you can do in your organization to get started practical questions you can ask. Again, we, we want to democratize threat hunting. Okay, so um, we're coming up on the end of time. We're almost done with the webinar, and I just want to reiterate the five points we've covered. First of all, traditional network visibility techniques do leave large gaps, uh, and you will not end up with the data you need uh, to resolve or understand a sophisticated attack, and that's a problem. Uh, secondly, NDR is the right solution to that problem. Thirdly, um, we believe in open NDR. We believe the vision of open NDR offers many advantages, speed, flexibility, community leverage, minimal lock-in. Fourth, you do need a strategy for encrypted traffic. And fifth, it's time to start continuous threat hunting in your organization. It doesn't need to be expensive or intimidating, but it's time to get started. Okay, thanks for attending. And I'm um, John, do we have time for a couple of questions? Yeah, if we're going to keep ourselves to the 30 minute mark, we've got about two and a half minutes left and we have a few questions. Uh, let's try to get to as many as we can. Uh, so first question uh, up is, uh, do you think in light of those uh, gaps that you mentioned, do you think packet capture has a role to play in security operations going forward? Um, I, I, I think the answer is an unqualified yes. Uh, however, uh, I think you need to be really cognizant about what packets you're capturing. And a lot of solutions are very, uh, indiscriminate and it's kind of the whole fire hose of, of, of traffic being captured. But if you think about that, right, if, if most network traffic is encrypted, if adversaries like uh, the adversaries behind the, the SolarWinds attack uh, are encrypting their C2 communications, um, right, what's the value of an encrypted packet? Uh, very little to, to none. And so what you should instead be doing with that sort of encrypted traffic is the kind of techniques that Greg mentioned where you're basically looking at metadata and characteristics around observable characteristics around that encrypted connection to make inferences uh, to direct you in your investigation. And there's just a ton of, of juice to be squeezed uh, out of that sort of approach to encrypted traffic. So from a packet capture perspective, you might not want to capture encrypted packets, but there's plenty of packets that are still unencrypted in your environment. And yes, sometimes in your investigation, you're going to need to go uh, to that payload level detail and you're going to need to go to the packets. Um, so I do think it has a role to play. I just think that the, many customers probably should be rethinking their their investments in kind of whole hog packet capture. Um, Greg, any comment there before I go to the next question? No, I think you nailed it. The, I, I'm not sure the ideal solution exists, but the ideal solution would be highly protocol aware and highly policy sensitive. Uh, and that's kind of what you want uh, out of a packet capture solution. 
great. All right, uh, we've got another question here. Uh, you mentioned that Zeek can see uh, around encrypted traffic. What protocols specifically can it tell me about? Um, so I think, Greg, you might have to help me out here, but off the top of my head, uh, there's an SSL log. Um, there's an X509 log, uh, which captures certificate details. Uh, there's RDP, uh, there's an SSH log. Um, I might be missing one or two or three, Greg. <laughs> Let me know if you yeah. can think of any off the top of your head. Yeah, there's some of the Windows logs that um, reveal information about encrypted connections. Um, and also, um, let's see, I would add that our own proprietary, so this isn't a Zeek solution, encrypted insights package um, is great for, this isn't um, to the question about protocols, but it's great for delivering inferences about what actually is happening inside. Um, and on the open source side, I will add that there's a lot of excitement around a new project that's connected with the Zeek project. We're promoting it as well called SPICY that enables the community to build new protocol parsers much more quickly. And I expect the number of protocol parsers that Zeek and therefore Corelight um, can deliver will grow significantly over time um, as this more, um, uh, is this simpler and easier platform gains traction. Great. Well, with that, I think we're at time. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you, Greg, for, for sharing your wisdom with us. And uh, just quickly, again, a copy of this presentation you can download in the handouts. There are hyperlinks uh, on slide 24 to those assets that Greg mentioned to get you started on a, on a threat hunting um, initiative at your organization. Um, there's many more there as well that you can probably find on our YouTube channel or website. Um, and so with that, uh, we're going to keep this short and sweet, as I promised, uh, one minute over a half hour. Thanks so much for joining us and have a great day.